Well, in British author Nick Hornby's globally best-selling 1995 novel High Fidelity, his character Rob at one point says the following... It's what you like, not what you're like, that counts in a relationship. A somewhat prescient line if you consider Nick Hornby's new novel, Juliet Naked. It's the tale of an unmarried couple, Annie and Duncan, who've fallen into complacency and are on the brink of a breakup. They cascade over that brink when Duncan falls in love with someone else, or rather, something else, an album by his musical hero, the reclusive songwriter Tucker Crow. The record is called Juliet Naked, and Annie, who's also a Crow fan, thinks this particular recording is crap, which leads Annie and Duncan to posting their rival reviews on a Tucker Crow message board. Suddenly, the album and the man who composed it are the symbols of everything that is difficult about romantic love, the dangers of idolization, how differences in perception can break a relationship, and whether one should trade in the possibility of transformative love for a more practical alternative. The award-winning five million best-selling writer Nick Hornby joins me now in Studio Q. Hello, sir. Hi, how are you? Very nice to have you here. Nice to be here. And I'm glad that you appreciate the Arsenal scarf that's hanging on the wall. I was pleased and surprised to see it there. (laughs) It's a great source of controversy (laughs) whenever we have British guests on (laughs) the show. Uh, Before we get into the bigger themes of this book, let me start with the characters. Can can you introduce us to Duncan? Well, Duncan... um, is a, a, a teacher at a further education college. He's um, obsessed with this with this guy, Tucker Crow, um, who made an album last in 1986. He runs Tucker Crow message board um, and c- collects bootlegs of every single Crow show. Um, Annie is his long-suffering partner who I think she describes him as... Uh, like a college friend who came to stay the night and they've been living together for 15 years. Right. Um, and then there's Tucker himself who emerges dramatically after a long silence to respond to Annie in particular and her review of his album. Now, Duncan is not entirely surprising if we're familiar with Nick Hornby novels. You seem to have a particular predilection for 30-something emotionally anorexic men. <laughs> Why? <laughs> well... I understand these people. Um, I think if you like music a lot and you like sport a lot, then you spend a lot of time with guys who care an awful lot about something that is maybe not immediately connected with their own home and family. Um, And I, I kind of... Well, I like these people. I like people who care a lot about something that Mm. isn't work. Um, I've made a lot of friends through passions. I think we we all have. I'm sure you have. Um, You have music friends. uh, Although you you subtly drew an analogy there between sports fans and music fans. Do you think it's true the the Led Zeppelin obsessive can be compared to the the Arsenal Football Club or the Edmonton Oilers obsessive as well? Well, I mean, for me, the big difference between sport and music is that music only brings me pleasure. Um, that <laughs> if, if a guy I like makes a bad album, I just don't buy his albums anymore. Whereas sport um, has made me more miserable than happy, <laughs> I would say. Right. You know, it's uncontrollable. Um, it's not purely a pleasurable relationship with an artifact. It's but you don't mean that. It hasn't made you more miserable. Yeah. I mean, no, really? I, oh, because... You're a football fan, a soccer fan, so you, you don't just enjoy it for the sake of watching it? It's not you don't get the pleasure out of that? Well, I do get the pleasure out of that, but um, in an average football season, there'll be five or six real low points. Mm. Um, and if you're lucky one or two high points. So I, I think you're always down on a season, and some seasons you're very down. Well, if, if Duncan is this prototypical, emotionally uh, meager man, uh, uh, this is not to say that you don't empathize with, uh, empathize with your female character, Annie. She's long suffered Duncan's obsession with Tucker Crow's music, this, this uh, legendary singer-songwriter who's not a, re- a recluse, uh, we find in the book, and has just realized that she's had about enough. Now, you've written Annie richly and with complexity. Do your empathies lie with her over Duncan, and, and why? For me, the the book was always going to be about Annie and Tucker um, and their relationship that develops firstly over the internet and, and later in person. Um, I mean, Duncan's kind of a pain in the arse and uh, I, I know too that these guys can be like that. He does get 
I think, his moment in the sun towards the end of the book, and he, he gets to articulate why fandom is important and why uh, this guy Tucker's music has right. been so important to me. I think he kind of helps to turn Tucker around a little bit. He does, yeah. Um, but... You know, the writer Ian Forster drew a distinction between flat and round characters, which you, you have to have in the same book. And I would say that Annie and Tucker are the round characters in the book. Well, so if there's, let's talk about Tucker, this this musician who becomes the lightning rod for their relationship problems between Annie and Duncan. Uh, there's a difference of opinion, of opinion over his album uh, that becomes the totem of everything that's wrong with Duncan and Annie. How important do you think matters of art an opinion are to romantic love, Nick Hornby? <laughs> um, well, I think they can be enormously important in the in the right or the wrong households. Um, I mean, I, I guess I live my life through art in some way or another. Um, things I consume are incredibly important to me and the things I create are incredibly important to me. So it occupies maybe a larger space in my household than it, than it does in others. But... Um, I think one of the processes of getting older is recognizing that different things mean different things to different people. And I didn't recognize that when I was younger. I used to get cross about stuff. That's a way of saying you've become more tolerant of other people's tastes. Um, I'm not even sure if it's more tolerant because I'm just as cranky as I always was. But <laughs> um, I think that one must not deny people's emotional connection with a thing and and in the end things like music and books you you start to see that uh i mean i imagine it as a very complicated socket that one has in one's back one of those computer sockets with like 15 pins in and some things just plug directly into you and it's very hard to articulate why i think you'd need to look at the history of someone's emotional and psychological development to understand why but some things fit better than others, and, and it's ridiculous, I think, to judge people on that basis. But this question that comes up in this book around this new Tucker Crow mm. record, which is actually a, a reimagining of his record. It's, 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 it's his, this iconic record that he made in uh, two decades ago, uh, redone with uh, Naked, so it's just stripped down to him and him and one instrument it, without all the uh, production quality. Yeah, well, it was, it was the demo versions of the, the original album, so it's actually not even new. It's just something that he's had kicking around for a long time. But the argument that happens between Duncan and Annie is so profound in the sense that it it forms the subtext of so many conversations we have on this show about what art is and who has the right to talk about it and what yes. and and who <laughs> you know who's qualified because Duncan who considers himself something not just of a Tucker Crow expert but a musicologist decides that this is a brilliant record and Annie then says I don't really like it as much and Duncan's response is uh, to be astounded hurt and to respond by saying are you qualified to decide that you don't like this? Yes. Uh, which is, a, a, you know, a, a, at first sounds intolerant, but is a major question that exists in the art world. Who's qualified to, to judge visual art or, or dance or, or anything uh, for that matter, any genre of art? Where do you stand on this question? Who do you think is qualified? You're a critic. <laughs> I think anyone is qualified. Um, one of the huge inspirations for this book was... Uh, uh, a, a work of non-fiction that a guy called John Carey wrote. John Carey's a, uh, a critic back in England, and he wrote a book called What Good Are the Arts? And a couple of chapters in that articulated better than anything I'd ever read this this whole problem. And he, he comes to the conclusion that if you think something's a work of art, it's a work of art. There is no other definition that makes any kind of sense or logic. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's who's qualified. If you think something's a work of art, you're right. What if you think something isn't a work of art? What about the teenager who says that classical music doesn't sound? I don't like that. And the and the the classical music aficionado who says, well, you just don't know. You don't know what it means. You don't know the concept. You don't know the context. Uh, let me explain it to you. This is kind of what's happening uh, between Duncan and Annie. Yes. Well, I think um, one of the difficulties with art is that when it comes down to it, it's a pleasure that takes place in our spare time <laughs> and um, if you have to do a degree course to appreciate something then you've probably lost the battle with it anyway I feel exactly the same with cl about classical music now as I did when I was 16 which is I don't get it um, 
it, it reminds me of church. <laughs> uh, it reminds me of school. I just only have bad connotations with it. Are you qualified to not like it? I'm absolutely not qualified <laughs> to not like it. But no one's going to do anything about it now. I, I think, you know, I'm 52 years old. I'm a smart enough guy. And if I don't like it, no one's going to send me on a re-education course. So in a, you are qualified, is your point. <laughs> you, you've written about music for many publications, including GQ, Time Out, The New Yorker. How much have your opinions on art, and I'm thinking music specifically, had an impact on your personal relationships? I think when I was younger, um, a huge impact that um, I tended to select relationships pretty much on on that basis. And, you know, I was the person who couldn't possibly have had a a girlfriend who loved Phil Collins. Um, but uh, that Phil has Collins. changed. He's always, <laughs> it's he's always, always trotted Collins, out, isn't, isn't he? Is he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, one thing I learned, I guess, was that people have relationships with these things for different reasons. And Phil Collins being an example, lots of people who like Phil Collins just like him because they... Music doesn't mean an enormous amount to them. It means some mm. something, but not an enormous amount. And if they see a Phil Collins uh, by a checkout in a supermarket, they'll buy it. They're not going to run off to an independent record store on the other side of town and spend four hours right. in there finding right. something that means something to me. Um, and I, I, I appreciate that. Another place that this book came from was um, my own fans' response to my work, which is that... You know, if, if someone comes up to me and says they've read High Fidelity 15 times, your first reaction, I think, is to say, I'm really sorry, you know, I, you shouldn't do that. You, you should go and read something else, someone better than me. But then again, you're denying the emotional connection that, mm. that this book speaks to this person, rightly or wrongly. And um, trying to make sense of one's critics as well as an artist. But it, what you said suggests that you, you ha, in the past at least, have been that Rob character in High Fidelity. It's yeah, what I'm, you like Rob was rather me, than, yeah. no, than what you're Absolutely. like. That's governed your relationships. But then you said that's the way you were when you were younger. Yeah. So that's changed? Uh, that's definitely changed. I still what, like what I like and I, I'm still passionate about music and I'm passionate about new music and I still do a lot of exploration. Um, but... I think one of the things that's changed is kids, uh, having kids, that I've made all sorts of relationships with people through my kids. Mm. And, and you realize, actually, you know, this person's a pretty good person and, um, and we have lots of other points of connection other than art and we don't talk about art, but there was, there's other stuff to talk about. There wasn't other stuff to talk about when I was younger. What about the subtext also uh, that happens in this book around the question of art or music um, with regards to accessibility and inaccessibility and how that dictates what people think is good or bad art. For, so in the case of this record, Juliet uh, Naked, Duncan uh, thinks it's a masterpiece uh, because it's difficult and particularly inaccessible, he thinks. Uh, and to some, that's the hallmark of worthy, interesting art. To others, just impenetrable tripe. Yeah. How, how do you differentiate? Um, I'm not so good with um, difficult stuff. Um, I probably would have made more more of an effort with the four-hour art movie when I was at college. But I guess my attitude now is that um, it's the artist's job to work hard so that the audience doesn't have to so much or the readership doesn't have to so much. That I think we all have to look for ways of saying what we want to say in ways that are understandable. <laughs> Yeah, but I but I guess what I'm saying partly is, I mean, even to use the, the example of Phil Collins, mm. um, he would probably be more critically revered if he hadn't sold so many records. Well, I'm, right? I'm, I'm, I mean, that, yes. you know, if he was obscure, then all of a sudden the quality of his melodies and the ability of his drumming and every, would, 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 would be trumpeted in a way that it isn't because he's a big pop star. Well, it's interesting... As somebody who maybe started uh, out as a literary writer, I think I've I seem to have got a lot less literary as I've sold more copies. Um, <laughs> in other words, it's made a difference in terms of people's perception. I I straddle two worlds. I think I'm I have one foot in each camp. You're uh, the successful author version of a pop song. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. So. Um, but it, it does make a difference to 
perception. You see it in different countries. If you don't sell many books in one country, you're a literary writer. If you sell a lot of books in one country, you're you're not a literary writer. And why is that? It's simply popularity. That it, uh, but why isn't popularity cool? Um, well, I think that there is a great distrust of public taste, and that's some, that's where I find it becomes a little bit sinister. Um, that. Uh, the the popular response is regarded as the stupid response. Right. The growth has to be in the right way because Radiohead are popular, mm. but still cool, still yeah. critically revered, and, and and they can be difficult. Yeah. Then they can be difficult. Mm. But so so what's the but, but it's okay that they've sold as many records because was it's because they never had the the huge hit. Is that the difference? I don't know. There are so many different examples in popular music because people, you know, one of the other things that this book is about is aut- authenticity. And, and actually, Tucker doesn't like his most successful album because he feels it's inauthentic. Well, you know, if you look at the history of cinema, popular music, I don't think Phil Spe- Spector's records were particularly authentic. Mm. They were fabrications in a studio Tamla Motown was a way of selling black music to white people and there is this happy accident where of the collision of art and commerce where something good comes out of it mm. American popular cinema of the 1940s was made to please audiences and they turned out to be some of the greatest films of all time focusing back on Tucker I, I want to go back to this uh, uh, th- this notion that I, I mean it, the, the, the damaged men in this book are, are interesting to assess because in some ways he's as clueless as Duncan. Uh, he's irresponsible with his children. He hasn't been able to hang on to a, a woman. He's been divorced many times. Uh, but he's still mythologized as a musical genius. Uh, as, so I, And I wonder, therefore, if he's a, able to get away with things that other people wouldn't be able to get away with. In other words, when somebody embodies some sort of mythology or mystique uh, or idol, uh, idolatry to us, that we accept things about them, adultery or not being able to hang on to a, 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 a relationship or the way they treat their children, that we wouldn't accept in others. Yeah, and, and um, it was one reason I wanted to write about an artist because I quite often have, shall we say, quite rich <laughs> domestic lives. But... Um, the perception of an artist dep- changes according to who it is. I mean, if you if you look at say Rod Stewart versus Bob Dylan, um, as far as I know, each has uh, a number of broken relationships right. and different children and all sorts of things in their past. But Rod Stewart, because of the career that he's had, is regarded as uh, somewhat tacky and in his. Uh, relationships with women but the Bob Dylan fans just decode everything there's nothing that Dylan can do that doesn't seem enigmatic even if he right. sells a right. sells a song to right. an underwear firm you've still got fans on he's the having us on he's doing he's it on purpose on. Yeah. exactly yeah. there is some level of irony that we're not getting but is it almost then that if you create one uh, or more uh, iconic piece of art you get a free pass I think it still depends on the nature of that piece of art, actually. Um, and I, I was thinking about the difference in some ways between Springsteen and, and Dylan. That um, Obviously, Springsteen has his obsessive fans, but I don't think he gets decoded in the same way because uh, everything's there in the music. I don't think people don't get Springsteen records. They either get them and like them and get or get them and don't like them. Uh, whereas Dylan um, can produce... You know, he could burp all over a, a CD for an hour and a half and you would be able to read something about it. I feel that way about Bowie. I've always said, you know, as a, as a massive Bowie fan, that it doesn't really matter what he... I'll trust him. He can make a, a, an album of him urinating and I'll still think it's cool because Bowie decided to do that. You know, this the got, trust I'm conferring upon this artist, right? I got two words for you, tin and machine. <laughs> yes. Have you well, decoded those? <laughs> I, see, I see. I, I, indeed, I have, and I'm, I'm even a fan of that. You're stuff. a fan of that's how far, I, yeah. Right. You know. And the Laughing Gnome, <laughs> huge fan, <laughs> huge fan of the Laughing Gnome. You go. I was born in London. I was a kid. We, okay. Yeah. That, no, that's that's. No, you're not going to touch that. <laughs> David Jones. Some things are yeah, sacred. Early, early Bowie. <laughs> yeah. So, in this book, speaking of sacred, there's a sense that music is an easy porthole uh, to a transformative experience. And you've just talked about the way music can resonate. Uh, on the other hand, 
uh, some romantics might say that that can only be achieved through love. Well, do you think there is a level of what is more transformative when it, when we talk about love or an art like music? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, of course, love can only transform uh, the recipients, uh, the people who are experiencing it, whereas art can, if you're lucky, transform huge numbers of people. Uh, and I guess that's where it has the advantage. That's a good answer, Nick Hardy. <laughs> Thank you very much. I liked it, yeah. And quite I've never that given one. it before to anyone either. I really haven't. That was a Nick Hornby thinking, exclusive? I was, was thinking it? on my feet there, God. Where do you, where do you uh, see yourself going? Where do you see yourself on, the, on, the, on your journey at this point? Uh, what, you know, when you talk about the kind of success that you've had, is that a way that you judge yourself at this point? Will you look at a book like this that comes out today and, and uh, think it's uh, one of your better works if it happens to sell a few million copies? Or does that uh, enter into your mind? I mean, I no, know you, want, you know, obviously I th- want a career, but... Yeah, I think there are all sorts of reasons why things sell and don't sell. So um, I don't think you want to get into, into that game particularly. If my publishers decide that they're not going to spend a single penny promoting this book it won't sell any copies and that that wouldn't alter the quality of it and the quality will remain the same um i mean for me at this point what i'm most interested in is doing as much work as i can in as many different media as i can so uh, i'm very proud of this novel i'm very proud of an education that that's um just about to come out um and it's the opportunity that it, it offers i've been doing um, making an album with Ben Folds the last few months. and I've read about that. Now, what does that mean? You've been making an album with Ben Folds. Are you s- singing? Or no. I, you're, you're, I, I, you're the tambourine? I, Are you writing the even lyrics? Even making an album is uh, over-dramatizing my own uh, contribution <laughs> to it. I just like saying I'm making an album with Ben <laughs> right, Folds. Right. I send him some stuff via email. That's what I do. Lyrics, you mean? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, I mean, the idea is that I have all the lyrics on his next album. Um, so, so we're trying to get together a collection of songs where he's done the music and I've done the words. But, you know, it's fantastically exciting uh, as a music fan and as a fan of Ben's work just to send these words that then come back as songs. I've had no other involvement than that. Still seems to me like he's got the hard job. That's one way to to get to to break into the, the music business at the top levels with a great songwriter is sell a few million books. And then the and then the songwriter of choice will want to work with you. I'm I'm not messing about. <laughs> <laughs> what about it's, a, it's been a canny plan, Nick Hornby. Do you, do hits matter to you? Do you want this? Do you, the, it's another way of asking the question I just asked. But I wonder when you've had books that have done as well as they have, they've been made into movies. Uh, does does that start to become addictive? M- much like a musician that starts scoring billboards hits, hits and you know David Foster was sitting where you're this is the great Canadian producer, or, yeah, uh, and he, the guy literally, I mean, you know, he admitted as much. Judges his work based on whether he, he wins Grammy awards or not. You know, he he said I hadn't won a Grammy for a while, so I didn't think I'd been was doing so well. Do you become addicted to hits, and does that matter to you? Um. It depends what it is. This, I would like this book to be a hit. It's a, a novel written for as many people as want to read it, and I hope that's a lot of people. And I got paid well to write it, so I would like to pay the publishers back. Um, a couple of books ago, um, I released a collection of columns about reading that I'd been writing for the Believer magazine in the States. There was never any possibility of that being a hit. Um, there are certain people who love the column, and that book was was for them really so in that way it's horses for courses but uh i do get there are some enormous pleasures that one gets from um being read Hmm. by lots of people um for the second summer in a row i've watched somebody read high fidelity by a swimming pool um while i was on the other side of the swimming pool and you know stuff like that's a lot of fun <laughs> i don't understand somebody was reading it, it publicly about, about yeah it was like pool? their holiday reading and i was on oh, one I see. side I of see. the right. pool and somebody not, uh, not reading it out loud not right. reading it out loud right. sorry right. not a performance uh, not, not a performance no just uh right. it was a very attractive girl in right. fact reading reading high fidelity you didn't think you didn't think to go over and say by the way it's in the end i did because <laughs> did yeah because 
you know, like we were both going to the same pool day after day and she was taking the book day after day and after a little while you think it begins to seem <laughs> weird <laughs> right. not saying anything. <laughs> right, right. And also um, I was getting distracted by it as well. So what did you say? I said it just seems too weird to say nothing. So I wrote that book and... Um, what did she say? <laughs> she said, oh my God, that is weird. And... Um, and I, I said, you know, I was just getting worried with the frequency with which you're putting it down and falling asleep and going for a swim. And she very sweetly said she was trying to make it last. <laughs> oh, sorry, I can't. Listen, I, 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 I hate to save the, uh, the, the hardball questions for the end. And you'll forgive me if I get controversial here on, on a final question. But does Arsenal stand any chance of ending up at the top of the Premier League this year? I do think at the moment, We've got half a chance, um, and i probably giving away recording secrets by saying that um, it really depends on the next couple of games, and they will have been played by the time <laughs> this show is broadcast. Uh, but um, the way they started, uh, I, having been a real doubter um, of Arsene Wenger's policy last season, where I saw some of the worst stuff I've seen in 10 years of, of watching Arsenal with him as a manager, that the way they started this season, you thought, you know, this actually might work. These young players are now beginning to look like players. Um, they've got a decent squad. And when, when they play football to the best of their ability, I don't think there's anyone in Europe who can match them apart from Barcelona. That, the speed of the one-touch passing thing is just so amazing to watch. But they've got this... Soft centre, the mm. game that they lost at Old Trafford. They were the better team, as they have been so often in these games the last two or three years, and they gave away two calamitous goals and lost 2-1. About two years ago, I thought, or maybe uh, yeah, maybe two years ago, I thought they were the best team in the world. But yeah. I'm not so sure. That, the first half of that season when Edward, before Eduardo broke his leg. That's right. Yeah. Nick Hornby, it's a great pleasure to have you here. It's been a Thanks. pleasure. Thanks so much for making the time. That is best-selling British author Nick Hornby. His new novel is called Juliet Naked, and he's been with me here in Studio Q.